Hey everybody, good to see you back once again. Let's get after it. So everything I have left to finish on X231 this spring is on the bench. We're still waiting on the steel for the clutch lever. That's due in late tomorrow, so we've got a little bit of time. And I'm not in much of a hydraulic pump mood yet, so that leaves us with the brakes. And everything right here is pretty much the same as the production 445 tractor, at least in the pressure plate and brake disc department. Everything else is pretty crude how they actually set it up on this tractor. So before we get into the compare and contrast part of it, I think I'm just going to get all these apart because they're all sticky. You know, get everything cleaned up, freed up, see if we're going to need to buy anything to get these back to uh, proper working order. And then we'll go from there. So let's begin the disassembly. All right. So we've got an expanding pressure plate in the middle. We have a brake disc on one side of it and another brake disc on the other side of it. And then we have the, uh, the cover opening that basically seals off the brake compartment. And these two pressure plates are held together by these two springs, one on each side. So we need to get those springs off. Sometimes they can be a little bit of a challenge unless you can hook them just right. And because the camera's on, we're probably not going to do any of it just right. We'll do the best that we can. I was able to lift that one just a little. We will put our universal prying device under it. There. Should be able to roll it off. The first one's always the toughest one to do. There we are. The second one gets a lot easier because now we can hinge that plate up, get some of the pressure off of it, and pretty much roll it right off the side. All right, so we can then hinge these apart. We have four large ball bearings on the inside. These are all 7 8 inch diameter, just like the production tractors are. So we can take the springs off of the other plate and we are held together by these two links and the clevis in the center. So the first thing I'm going to do is just uh, remove this cotter pin and the main pivot, take that clevis off of there, and then evaluate whether or not I even need to take the two links off of the pressure plates. I might be able to leave all those intact if everything looks good. All right, pin out. These definitely require a good cleaning. Every All these pivots are so rusty and stuck. Stubborn right to the end. There we got it. Those seem just fine though. No troubles there at all, so I think I can clean those well enough. And pretty simple, I just carried out all the same steps to the pieces for the other side. So before we can go much further, I need to get all this stuff cleaned up so we can really see what we're looking at. So catch back up with you all in a bit. And just finished with the final piece. So everything here cleaned up pretty well and hardware is all good. Clevises were in good condition. You want to pay special attention to the threads inside of them because if the gem nut on the pull rod ever loosened up, it would start pulling the threads out of them. These are in very good condition. Rest of the hardware is good. Our standoff spacers, which are a very prototype design. We'll get into that in a bit. Those are good. Brake discs, okay, so three of the four were just about like this. I'm assuming they started out about a half inch thick. Um, if so, three of the four had about a sixteenth of an inch worn off of them, max. But this one right here, you can see this friction on the inside, it's pretty close to giving up. So being that we had wear on all four of them, I decided just to order up four new brake discs they will be here next week sometime. So once again, broken record, I know we can't do all the brakes to completion today, but we can get all this stuff ready just to drop into the chassis. 
The pressure plates are not bad. The ones on this side looked like brand new, very little wear. The ones, this is the right side right here. The ones on the right had a little bit more wear, you can see from the dark shadows, but still, they are not too bad. I did rough them all up, give them a fresh checkered surface finish. That helps the new uh, shoes to wear in a little bit better. Got that one done, as well as the, uh, the outer plates as well. And the ball ramps all looked really good in them. So we don't have any grooves or any catches that we have to worry about there. And the, uh, the ball bearings that go in there also were all in very good shape. So um, let's just uh, tell you what, throw these pressure plate or actuator assemblies as the manual calls them together. I'll show you quickly how they work and we'll move on from there. So both of these plates are machined essentially the same. So the four balls drop into the pockets, but you will see the pockets are rounded on this end, but they are tapered on the other end. And that acts as like a cam ramp, okay? So when these are put together properly, those cam ramps actually oppose one another. And you have the two pull rods come together in the center like that, brake pedal pulls on those, and when these rods are pulled in this direction, you get a twisting action that spreads the plates. Like that. You see how those ball bearings want to roll up the tapered sides of those pockets, and when these links are pulled, that forces these two plates apart, and there's a brake disc on this side and a brake disc on the other side, and it just applies pressure to those discs between the outer cover and the inner bull pinion bearing plate. And because each brake disc splines directly to the outer end of each bull pinion, that is how those pressure plates stop one bull pinion or the other, which in turn stops one axle or the other, or both at the same time. Pretty simple system, really. And when I'm putting these together, I'll coat the pockets and the ball bearings with this. Um, this is Motorcraft. This is the XG3A silicone brake caliper grease and dielectric compound. We used this stuff all the time at the Ford dealer to put behind uh, the brake shoes on drum brakes where they ride against the backing plate. Also for disc brake caliper pins, it resists moisture, keeps the rust down, lubricates, and also. Uh, is made to operate in dirty, dusty environments and not really absorb that dust very much. I mean, it's about as good as you can get, really. So there's always been a debate whether or not you want to put these ball bearings in absolutely dry because regular grease is going to attract dust or put something on them. I just uh, choose to uh, go this route here because I've got plenty of experience with it. And always had uh, good results in the past. And whenever possible, load some new springs on there, especially if the old ones are, you know, 40, 50 years old or <laughs> cannot be determined. So, yep, liking how that's working right there. And just like during disassembly, the first spring goes a lot easier than the second one. But we've got them hooked on both sides. So at this point, we can bring both of the pull links together. We can pin the clevis on as well. And I put some regular grease on this pin. I like having these pivots lubricated somewhat. Really makes a difference in how well these brakes work if everything moves freely. So we can also put these cotter pins in with a permanent bend as well, because we won't need to take these pieces back apart. Okay, everybody, it is compare and contrast time. So I'll load the whole middle of the bench full of the production pieces. All right, right there. So the first thing we'll look at are these, um, these cover plates. And um, the prototype ones, you can see, are flat on the outside, and they've got that recess cut into the center. This one is the same as well. And that recess is to provide clearance for the end of the 
bull pinion shaft right there because if it was flat that would contact the center so you can look at this plate this would be the right side plate on a production tractor we have a noticeable bump on the outside because they just transferred it like with a very robust press die to create that uh, that clearance on the inside and it just bumps out to the outside so at a glance you can tell that is a production cover we don't have any X numbers on any of these it was just pieces that they made so production left side brake cover you can tell we've got a lot more going on so first thing you'll notice it's a heavy cast piece all right and we've got this speedometer slash odometer drive that mounts in it and we've got this uh, it's basically a plug that has gear threads cut on it so on the production tractor we would not have this large welch plug there this would actually go inside of the bull pinion um, sink in there with a like a cinch bolt and then as that bull pinion turned it would then drive this uh, this odometer cable so quite the difference in the covers between prototype there there and production right there and right there for this next step now I just have to place a pressure plate pack onto an opening cover so another noticeable difference is the spacers for the prototype okay they are a heavy steel bodied square design and they go around the three bolts that hold the cover to the rear case and they center that pressure plate and um, brake disc pack on the cover so contrast that with the production ones and they are round all right so one of them has a single groove machined at the top and then two of them have double grooves machined at the top and the reason for that is for identification if we place these side by side you can see the one on the top is a little bit bigger around than the one on the bottom and this has to do with uh, positioning them properly around the pressure plate and brake disc pack to get everything centered up and working properly so I'll explain why that's important here shortly so that pretty much uh, does it for the major differences between prototype and production other than the prototype hardware that holds these cover plates on is a little bit unique they ran one stud with two bolts on each side cover if we blow this picture up from the sandblasting days we can clearly see bolt bolt but then on the bottom stud with a nut and the other side was the same way on that cover so i believe they did that just to uh, make it a little bit more convenient to start these square sided spacers and actually have one rather lined up with the pressure plate which would automatically line the other two in as they were fed in with the bolts in the cover and we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves but these production covers used three of these bolts standard instead of two bolts and a stud because i think it was just easier to line everything in on round spacers than it was lining to flats on square ones so for now we can install both of these studs into X231's case. We can get a little bit of a jump on the process by doing that. We drop one. Let's just drop the other one too. I should also mention that this hole and this hole on each side are blind holes, so we don't have to put any kind of thread sealer on these studs. Of course, keeping these disc brakes free from oil and grease is one of the major keys to uh, keeping them working properly. But uh, when it comes to this upper hole right here, that is an open hole into the rear case. I'll get you off the pole here, I can show you all. So we also have to be careful. All right, see the light in there from the flashlight? And that is the bull gear right behind that. So we do have to watch the bolt length on this one 
to make sure we don't come all the way in and hit the edge of that gear. That is one of the critical parts of this job here. So I'll peel the jam nut off of this one as soon as I free up the other hand and we'll move on. All right, so the reason why I believe they went with a single stud at the bottom for the prototype has to do, again, with these square spacers. You can slide one in place and it's already there. So what you do next is throw the first brake disc onto the bull pinion and then come the pressure plates, line the clevis through the opening at the bottom of the compartment here. And you can see how this first spacer is already supporting that pressure plate. Outer brake disc would go on and then you would have the other two bolts with the spacers preloaded in the cover and you would throw those on with the cover at the same time. But being that we have these flat sided spacers, I believe having one in place supporting the pressure plate somewhat centering everything makes it easier to start these other two in with corresponding flat sides against the plates instead of having one on its edge like that and then the corner catches and you're trying to fight three of them. So I think that's why they did that. It was just ease of installation. So we'll just start these other two so they can be in place representative. So you can see how we're supported right there and right there for the pressure plates so that when the pull rod starts you know, exerting tension upon them, we are bearing directly up against those two. This one back here, pretty much free floats. It's just a spacer. But that ties into the reason why the production tractors have two different sized round spacers, okay? So we've got the single groove one that's slightly smaller around. That one must be positioned up here. And if these square ones are any guide, this one really isn't doing anything. It's just a standoff spacer for the cover. So this can be smaller in diameter, can go up there. But then the double groove ones, larger in diameter, they go right there and right there. And they are the ones that center this whole assembly up with the bull pinion and take the brunt of the load as the brakes are being applied. Why they didn't just go with three of the same size spacers on the production, I don't know, but we had to throw this one in there just to make it confusing. So if you're putting the brakes together on a production tractor, single groove small one goes up there. Remember that, you'll be just fine. And the last pieces I wanted to talk about are these. It's the flat washer with the coil spring, one for each side, and they go around the clevis and help to seal that rather large opening. They are a dirt slash dust shield or a rodent blocker, all of the above. So the coil spring keeps the washer held up against that opening. And when the brakes are pulling on the clevises, that spring can move along with it while keeping constant tension on the washer, keeping that passageway down to a minimum. So kind of insignificant sounding little piece, but actually could come in quite handy depending on what your operating conditions are. So. Unfortunately, this is about as far as we can go with this today, not having brake discs. So just take the rest of this stuff back to the bench and that pretty much wraps another episode. So hopefully everything that's on the bench here now makes perfect sense. As soon as the new parts show up, all this stuff is going to be put into the tractor tomorrow. The material for the live power lever is also due in. So if that gets delivered, we will be working on live power lever and top cover for the back end. If it does not show up, we'll be doing hydraulic pump. Either way, something's getting done. Thank you again for watching everyone and hope to see you all back.